Hi everyone, I hope you're doing well today. In this video, I'm just going to be talking about my nonfiction collection. This is kind of a contrived shelf because actually I have tried to integrate my nonfiction, which is a very small number of books, into my fiction collection because I like to have things chronologically ordered. Um, but I thought I'd just gather them all here together, excluding any books I've talked about before, at least as much as possible and also excluding my polar exploration books because I'll be doing another video on those. So uh, yeah, let's get started just sort of going chronologically. Um, Joan of Arc in her own words. This is a pretty cool book. It is a collection of things that she said and wrote and uh, the editor basically constructed an autobiography out of those quotes. Um, so yeah, it's pretty sparse because there's not a ton of her writing that we have, but it's a nice primary source and a good companion piece to biographies or maybe Mark Twain's novel if you're into that, um, which I would actually really recommend, by the way. Um, it's been a long time since I read his novel, but it was really good. Uh, Two Old Women by Velma Wallace. I found this one at the thrift store and was intrigued. I love the cover design, by the way. Uh, it's about these two old women who get left behind by their tribe during this winter famine. And uh, this is in Alaska. And so it's about how they stick together and try to survive on their own. So it's in the style of a legend, but it's got some illustrations and it's a very touching and inspirational story, really. So, yeah, I would recommend this. It's probably, it's easy enough you could read it to kids, too. And I don't think there was really anything, like, I think it's suitable for kids. Uh, next couple of books I have here are jumping quite far ahead. We've got uh, Adventures in the Rocky Mountains by Isabella Bird and The Congo and the Cameroons by Mary Kingsley. These are both excerpts from... Uh, longer books, and these are both by uh, British female explorers. Mary Kingsley was quite a gutsy lady. Uh, fun fact about her, she actually met Mary Slessor at one point. Uh, Mary Slessor being a Scottish missionary. Uh, I enjoyed the book. It's definitely dated, so just keep that in mind. Uh, but it's it's very interesting if you want some insight on what it was like to travel back then, and especially as a single woman. Uh, Isabella Bird, kind of the same story, although I liked Isabella Bird a lot more, and I would actually want to read the entire book that this came from someday, because she's, she writes very, very entertainingly. And then kind of sticking with the... Uh, the Pioneer Wild West theme. We've got this book. It's pretty obscure. I found this at the thrift store as well. This is P.L.'s Polish Pioneers, written by one of the descendants of those immigrants. And I've just been trying to read more local history. So this is about those immigrants and where they came from, why they came to the U.S. when they did, and talks about the uh, the lumber industry and the traditions and things that they brought with them. It's very anecdotal, so it's not like one continuous narrative, but I found it quite interesting and a little sad because there's not really anything left of this community today, is my understanding. I think the last thing remaining was a church which has been... I believe, since pulled down, so, uh, yeah, interesting, a little sad, uh, but really illuminates to you what the immigrant experience was like uh, with all of its nuances. David Grand's The Lost City of Z, so both my parents read this and loved it, and we watched the movie together. I started to read it. I do want to finish reading it at some point. Uh, it's about this guy named Percy Fawcett, 
late 1800s, went out looking for this legendary lost city in the Amazon. And fun fact, T.E. Lawrence, uh, Lawrence of Arabia, actually wanted to go with him on one of his excursions. Um, it's actually a good thing he didn't, because Percy Fawcett, I believe it was on his second or third expedition, he never came back. And no one actually knows what happened to him. His body has never been discovered. Um, it It's quite a quite a labyrinth out there, so that's why no one successfully figured out what happened to him. So this book is kind of about that. It's about him. It's about his relationship with his son, who I believe also went with him. And it's also about just that whole fascination people had back then with this idea of lost cities and treasures and things. A really fun book. Or I should say a fun story. I haven't read the whole book yet. This Tesla biography, I am making progress in it. I've been making progress in it for like a year. <laughs> I think it's a great biography. It's definitely... There's plenty of technical elements in it. I mean, it's a... I believe it's published by Princeton. So not an easy book to read, let's just say. But I can tell it's pretty well written, and it has all of these original drawings and photographs. And it uses those throughout. I don't believe there's any contemporary photos or drawings, and I really love that detail because it just kind of puts you right back in time. It's a pretty famous photo of Tesla there. He was an interesting guy. Um, but again, this book is very technical, so it's I'm, I'm continually getting bogged down in that stuff, even though I think his life was really interesting. So I do plan to finish it, I just haven't been able to get there yet. Heretics and Orthodoxy by G.K. Chesterton. I really, really love this cover. I have read both of these books now. Um... I actually read Orthodoxy years ago, and then recent, more recently I read Heretics. Uh, Heretics is actually, it's not what you would think. It's more about um, Chesterton's contemporaries and talking about their philosophies and things. For example, he talks about Shaw, he talks about Wells, Kipling. I actually really loved that book. Um, Orthodoxy is kind of a memoir, kind of a, I mean, it's more of a memoir th than anything about how he came to be a Christian. Um, I, I'm planning to reread it because I barely remember it. Just one note on this edition, there are some pretty bad formatting typos, which are kind of disappointing, but other than that, it is nice to have both of these books in the same volume because they are related to each other. Next up we have Jack London, The Cruise of the Snark. And this was another secondhand find. This I just love these kinds of books to be honest. Anything to do with the age of sail and you know, people setting off in their boat. Uh, in this case, Jack London, he was kind of a character. He, I believe he espoused socialist ideas, but he kind of lived like a celebrity. So in this case, he's setting out on his private yacht with his partner and his uh, friends. And he goes off to visit Hawaii and I believe other Pacific islands as well. When was this? 1907. It was really cool to read his descriptions of Hawaii at the time. So, yeah, fun book. Um, Poetry of the First World War by, well, edited by Marcus Clapham. You know, I didn't actually love this as much as I thought I would. It is a beautiful edition, though, because it has all of these ornaments. Um, and it's a pretty good selection of poems by soldiers, poems by civilians, men and women. Um, 
I would say that most of the poems here kind of lean towards the cynical side, though, which I wasn't necessarily expecting. Um, but, you know, it's, it's a pretty good anthology and has a lot of different styles and authors in it. And, and then in the back it gives you a little biography of each of these people, which I thought was nice. Uh, let's see, The Silent World, Jacques Cousteau. So, I remember uh, they used to play Cousteau on PBS a lot. So, it was one of those things I kind of grew up with, but didn't really know much about. This is one of his memoirs. A new era of undersea exploration began in 1944 when a trio of young Frenchmen slipped below the surface of the Mediterranean Sea with the first aqua lung. So this book talks about the aqua lung. Uh, it talks just about, you know, the early days of, of Cousteau. It's a very slow-going kind of memoir. I mean, it's not bad, it's just not super gripping. Um, Next up, we have Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. I just bought this one. I've read it years ago. Uh, I've been meaning to reread it for a long time now. And what I remember about this is it is a memoir of his experiences in concentration camps. So it's partly that. It's also partly about his philosophy of logotherapy. Frankl's theory holds that our primary drive in life is not pleasure, as Freud maintained, but the discovery and pursuit of what we personally find meaningful. So last time I read this, the three things that really stood out to me were, one, everyone has their own meaning of life, which is particular to that person. Every situation has a reason. And the third one was, suffering is not necessary, it's not requisite for meaning, but you can find meaning in suffering. And I don't necessarily agree with him on all of those. Uh, what I did like, though, was that last point. You don't have to be a suffering person in order to create great art or to have great meaning. I, I feel like so often in culture, people think that only the tortured artists put out great work, but I don't think that's really true. Everybody does have their own struggles, which uh, influence their art, but I don't know that that's necessary to create great art, but that's kind of a whole other topic. Let's see, so now we're really moving into the mid-1900s. We've got Evita here. Evita, the life, the real life of Eva Peron. What can I say? This was a kind of a sad biography in that there's like barely any notes. I mean, there's some, but it's not like, there's not really that many notes, but it's the, or it was when I read this, which has been probably five, six years now. At the time, it was the best one that was out there according to all the reviews, and it is supposed to be the most balanced biography of her. Uh, not, not like being too unkind or too sensational, um, but it is a very sensational story uh, about Eva Duarte, who becomes the mistress of Perón, Juan Perón, and then basically the whole political social movement that she was part of as his wife, and really a cultural icon for Argentina during that time. Very interesting book. What I really thought was particularly relevant about this biography is it talked about, you know, what happens when one person or even two people have control over your media. And she started out you know, I think she was an actress. She worked in radio at one point. But yeah, media and the control that media has over you know, any country aspiring to democracy, uh, this really illustrates what can go wrong there. So I thought it was a really good read for that reason, especially. Fear No Evil by 
Nathan Sharonsky. I don't know if I said his name right. It is a memoir of this um, this Jewish man who wanted to immigrate to Israel in the 70s, and the Soviet Union was uh, rather against that. He he was basically a dissident, so I think they were just trying to keep an eye on him and didn't want him to be able to leave like that. Uh, so actually his wife got to leave, but he did not. He was imprisoned, and this book talks about the nine years he spent trying to win his freedom back. Uh, it's a pretty bleak book. It's very repetitive. It's very sobering, but it's also very inspirational. He talks about things like how um, having memorized the Psalms really helped him through some dark times, and just having these uh, these good habits and things that he did helped him survive, helped him outwit his captors, and yeah, it's just, there's a lot you can glean from this, honestly. So, also on the subject of Soviet or anti-Soviet writing, we've got Open Letters by Havel. This guy wrote an essay that I read years ago called The Power of the Powerless. When you're living in a society when, where everyone is kind of falling into line and you're being asked to do things like put up signs in your shop window that you don't agree with, but you know, you have a choice. You can either put it up in your shop window and just go along with it, or you can uh, refuse to display the communist slogan and lose your business or whatever. And so he talks about these very practical ways that dissent takes place, but he also speaks against this notion of dissent because he feels like it alienates those people from the greater social body. And the idea behind the power of the powerless is that the, the, the masses, we all have the power to bring an end to that kind of totalitarianism if each of us does our part. Even as something as simple as not displaying that sign in our window. Um, it's, I mean, he writes about it much better than I just explained, but I really enjoyed that essay. So this book is um, about some of his other writings. I didn't mention it, but he, he's from Czechoslovakia. Um, I really like his other writings as well. I haven't got that far yet, but um, you have to kind of read it slowly, though. He writes very well, but it's it's something you have to think through as you're reading it. So definitely recommend The Power of the Powerless. I believe it's free online. And uh, so far, I'm really appreciating these other things he wrote as well. Okay, so uh, next book here is part of that same um, Penguin Great Journey series, which I found at the thrift store. Uh, again, excerpts from lo longer works. So this one is from a book called The Shadow of the Sun by this Polish journalist. And it's really about his experiences and observations in Africa during the 60s and 70s, I believe. Uh, he talks about apartheid. He talks about... Idi Amin, the Ugandan dictator in the 70s, and he talks about the elite class that arose after the Europeans left some of these African countries. Um, again, though, this is just an excerpt, so you get little glimpses of all of those things. Um, I'm actually looking forward to reading the bigger version of this. I just find his writing style very approachable, very interesting. This is the kind of quality journalism I really like. So, uh, yes, The Cobra's Heart, great, great book. Um, but The Shadow of the Sun is probably worth checking out as well. A History of East Asia, I did a whole video on that one. I also mentioned in that video CEO China. 
uh, excellent book. AI Superpowers, another great book, which I also talked about. Um, won't talk about them in detail in this video, but one thing that he did talk about in AI Superpowers is the concept of universal basic income. And that was the first time I'd really heard about it. I'm going to circle back to that in just a minute, but a uh, permanent record. Let's talk about that. This is Edward Snowden's memoir that came out last year. Uh, Edward Snowden is still holed up in Russia. He is not allowed to come back to the United States yet. Uh, he talks about everything that led up to his decision to leak the information he had about the NSA spying on all of us. And it's a really good memoir. This, So I've really had a book hangover ever since I finished this one. Um, it's a very down-to-earth memoir. Talks about his childhood. Talks about him falling in love. Um, and of course, all of the all, all of the things that were going on in his mind as he decided to become a whistleblower. Uh, what I really loved about this book, though, even more than that, was how he painted the picture of what it was like to grow up before and then after 9-11, and sort of coming of age during that time. Uh, there was so much I could relate to that. The way the internet changed, the way just our whole concept of patriotism changed. So, very interesting book. I should mention, too, he talks about his experiences trying to join the military after 9-11. So, there's a lot there that you may not know about Edward Snowden. I think it's a great memoir. Uh, there's also a companion podcast interview with Joe Rogan, which I also saw, and that kind of summarizes things he talks about in this book. But I would say definitely read the book because he goes into all of those things in good detail. I didn't feel like it was an arrogant book or anything like that. I think it was pretty honest and, yeah, very sobering. Universal Basic Income. So <laughs> this is Andrew Yang's book. Andrew Yang being the recently, uh, he, well, he recently was running for president. He has now dropped out. I don't want to get too political in this video, but he talks about what's going on with the loss of jobs in America. And really, uh, Kai-Fu Lee would say all over the world. Um, but the way robots are replacing a lot of jobs that people would have had, uh, normal people, and he talks about what he means by normal people. And, you know, what, what are we going to do with all these people who are unemployed? Um, what kind of jobs are going to be automated very soon? And what is wonderful about this book is that it's not even that political. This is not a book where Andrew Yang is like, um, talking about all the wonderful things he did. I mean, he does talk about himself, obviously, because he was running for president, but the bulk of the book is really, you know, charts, numbers, um, data that shows the kind of problems that we are seeing economically. And so I think this is a fantastic book. Now, I don't necessarily agree with all of his takeaways and recommendations, but I think he does make a good case for universal basic income. And regardless of whether you are in favor of that or not, uh, the way he outlines the kind of problems we're seeing is worth a read. And this, I think, would appeal to people from any political background. This is not partisan stuff. This is just things that are happening and problems that we need to address in some way. So, 
super good book. Um, I also read his other book called Smart People Should Build Things. That was also a good book about how college isn't what everyone <laughs> claims it is, how it doesn't really help everybody and not everybody is suited for it. But this is a better book because it's less about, you know, the specific case of college students and this is more about just anybody who is trying to care for themselves and their families. So that's all I have for nonfiction at this time. Um, I have read more nonfiction, it's just that I don't necessarily own all of those books. Uh, please like the video if you enjoyed it, and let me know if you have any recommendations or questions. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.